Dave Kilcullen is uh, a counterinsurgency expert. He was the chief counterterrorism strategist in the Bush administration. He was counterinsurgency advisor to General Petraeus in Iraq and uh, later to Condoleezza Rice. He gave the game away um, when the administrations changed simply because the opportunity presented itself and he had been blown up five times by IEDs. He now teaches a course in counterinsurgency at the School of Advanced International Studies, which is part of Johns Hopkins University, apart from other consulting jobs, which we're not at liberty to talk about. Um, now, the, the topic tonight is that the end justifies the means. And um, you will have noticed in the program that it's supposed to be an explosive encounter. Uh, it doesn't mean that he's going to be blown up a sixth time. In fact, in discussion with Dave, it's apparent that he and I agree on almost everything. So it's not also, it's not equally clear that you will agree with what we think. So at about the 40 minutes mark, we're going to invite questions from you and provided they're intelligible, we don't mind questions that are hostile. Can I start on the topic with um, a hypothetical? It's late 2001. You're at Tora Bora. Uh, the coalition of the willing in its earlier life have got Osama bin Laden surrounded. He's hooked up to his dialysis machine and you have literally got him in your sights. If you pull the trigger, he's dead. What will you do? Can I ask you a question about that hypothetical? Yeah. What, what's my alternative to killing him? The alternative is to capture him, if you can. I think you, you do always, have him surrounded. I, I think you would always be better in those circumstances to go for a capture rather than a kill. Um, and I say that on practical grounds um, rather than anything particularly moral. Um, primarily because if you look at the broad sweep of counterinsurgency over the last 200, 250 years, it is extremely rare to win a counterinsurgency without negotiating some kind of solution with the insurgent. Um, and in the case of Al-Qaeda, um, if you kill Osama bin Laden in 2001, who are you going to negotiate with? Um, and so I, I think that uh, uh, if your option is capture or kill, then you should always go for the capture. Now, if you're going for a capture, of course, there's, first of all, a risk that on trial he'll be acquitted for one reason or another. Um, there's a risk that he will escape before he is finally tried. Um, there's also a risk that the Bush administration, when they learn what had happened, uh, will sack you. Does that change the way you decide it? I don't think so. War is a risky business and there's, there's risks with any choices that you make. Um, there are a lot of risks associated with trying to kill someone as well. Um, but one of the things that I wrote in one of the first pieces of counterinsurgency work that I did for the US government was um, a thing called 28 Articles, which became sort of a, a, a underground viral email that people sort of passed around in Iraq and Afghanistan. And one of the things in that document that I say is a defection is always better than a surrender, and a surrender is better than a capture, and a capture is better than a kill. Because this is about convincing people to stop fighting you. And unless you contemplate genocide, um, and we don't, then you really can't kill your way out of this problem. Um, you have to start winning people over. And one of the things that you do to, to make that happen is you have to make it as hard as you can to stay in the insurgency and as easy as possible to leave. Now, it's interesting that you um, identify practical reasons for capture rather than kill. The ethical argument would be that in the circumstances, he's a non-state actor and to kill him would be murder. You may feel justified in murdering, but the means being murder um, would, not, uh, just, would not be justified by the end of removing um, ter terrorist number one. Uh, does, does that ethical dimension play any role in your decision making? Well, ethics, ethics are critical in counterinsurgency. Um, <clears throat> but I happen to think that it wouldn't actually be murder to kill Osama bin Laden on a battlefield. Um, he has... He's, he's hooked up to a dialysis machine and a, you know, well, he's not on the battlefield. Uh, uh, you know that didn't actually happen, right? Um, he, um, you know, he was in the field carrying a weapon, um, part of a military organisation. 
He had declared war on the United States and the rest of the Western community, including Australia, three times before the, um, the invasion of Afghanistan. Well, Prince Leonard of Hutt, I think, has declared war on Australia occasionally, but would that justify us in taking him out if we could? Well, if, if he had actually taken up arms against the, the Australian government and was engaged in a civil war, uh, that would be a different matter from setting up a tourist industry on the, on the basis of, uh, you know, okay. heart of a province. So, you know, the, if it's an internal civil war... Right, well, this is the point. I mean, do you, do you think that the war on terrorism is a metaphor or is it actually a real war? Well, it's a metaphor, obviously. Well, I, I don't think that everyone agrees with that. How, um, how do you negotiate with an abstract noun? Well, no, no the, the war on... And that's what I say in my book, of course, as you know, because you've read it. Um, but the, um, the, the point is that if an organization, and in this case Al-Qaeda, declares war on a state, and that state ends up at war with that organization, then you're in the realms of, I guess, the additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions in 1977. You're in the realm of uh, a war between a state and a non-state actor. And one of the problems that we have in dealing with the threats that we have now is the Geneva Convention and the additional protocols are written for internal conflict, you know, civil war inside one country. That's not what we have here. We have transnational war between a non-state actor uh, and the international community. So I don't think that the war against Al-Qaeda is a metaphor. I think that the war on terrorism is a meaningless concept. Um, but that's not what we were doing in 2001, and it's certainly not what we were doing in Iraq in 2007. Um, Al-Qaeda was a real armed insurgent organization, uh, and therefore I think they were entitled not only to be fought, but also to be fought according to the rules of war. But they were, um, they, let's call them a criminal organisation, plainly that's accurate, even if it's not complete. Um, they had committed a criminal act uh, on, Australia, on American territory. Um, does that mean that they are outlaws in the sense that you can simply kill them if you get the chance and your strategic decision is that killing them is better than the alternatives? I think that if you're talking about Al-Qaeda in a war zone, as in Iraq or Afghanistan or some of the other places where there's an open war going on, uh, then it, it's, a, it's a case of warfare. But, the but open if you're talking war... about an Al-Qaeda cell, let's say in Sydney or in Paris or in New York, then that very clearly in my mind falls into a uh, law enforcement paradigm. Yeah, but you see the open war in Afghanistan was a result of the American invasion of Afghanistan. It wasn't a result of any activities of Al-Qaeda. So does that mean if you respond to their aggression sorry, in America... Sorry, can you say that again? Well, you're saying that we just invaded... We invaded them because of the attack on America. OK, so a criminal gang attacks America, and in response, we invade their headquarters in Afghanistan, and it's only that circumstance that puts them on the field of battle. Now, is this much different, legally or morally, from um, the American law enforcement agencies um, going and blowing up the, you know, the compound at Waco? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's the same or different from a law enforcement standpoint, but I think from in, in terms of the, the laws of war, um, I, I think it's very difficult to argue a position that um, the war in Afghanistan was anything other than an interstate war by the time we were on the ground in 2001. I mean, the Afghan government were given a number of opportunities to mm. hand over al-Qaeda or to give the, uh, the, um, the guilty parties to justice and refused to do so, both before and after 9-11, in fact. And, of course, this was the third declaration of war that Osama bin Laden had made, but it was also about the ninth or tenth attack on uh, US and international targets. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'd remind you, obvious point, but um, NATO invoked Article 5, Australia invoked the ANZUS Treaty. Uh, there were, it wasn't just America against uh, Osama bin Laden. It was pretty much the whole civilized world, in fact. Mm. Um, and you can argue, and reasonable people can disagree, about what should have been done on the field of battle once we got there. Uh, but I do think that the war in Afghanistan that proceeded after 9-11, um, at that time and probably still now, has a whole different level of international support than what happened, let's say, for example, in Iraq. Um, I think they're qualitatively quite different. What about the use uh, by the State of Israel of um, un uh, unmanned drones to take out Hezbollah and Hamas leaders when they can? Well, generally in strategic terms, and you'd be more familiar with this than, than myself, I'm sure, but there's a, there's a principle that was really adhered to up until around the time that Pinochet went on, went on trial in London of, sov of sovereign immunity, that mm. um, if you were the, a head of state, 
um, or a, a leader that it was uh, considered improper um, to target the leader directly. And one of the practical reasons why I think as a strategist that that idea came about was because um, if you try to kill the enemy head of state in the middle of a war, you're actually going to precipitate chaos and disruption in the enemy state. And who are you going to negotiate with? Who's going to be the power structure that you're actually able to engage with to end the war? Um, that's why we you know, uh, didn't try and kill Emperor Hirohito in, in World War II. You know? um, and that has been a, a generally accepted approach in warfare. Uh, until quite recently, Napoleon uh, was visible to Wellington's troops in the Battle of Waterloo, and one of the officers came up and said to uh, Wellington, "Should we, you know, shoot him?" And he said, "No, absolutely not. You know, who, who's going to who's going to surrender?" Um, mm. So I think that's that's been the traditional approach in conventional warfare. Yeah. Um, and I think this is where you you have to ask yourself: Is there a qualitative difference between warfare between states and warfare between states and non-state actors? And I think there is a qualitative difference. Mm. Um, and I think the war that we're in now sort of breaks some of the legal paradigms that, that existed before 9-11. Um, well, actually, probably they were already starting to come unstuck. Um, you know, the Kosovo intervention, for example, um, was not in accordance with um, international law as had been previously understood. The UN retrospectively retro um, uh, ratified, approved it, yeah. ratified it. But, but um, at the time, it was outside the paradigm. The difficulty with the, the difference, of course, is this. If it's not a war in the orthodox sense, then it's criminal activity, albeit criminal activity on a large scale. And at least in Western societies, we have for at least a century and a half embraced the notion of the rule of law, which means that no person is an outlaw, no person can simply be killed on site because they are available to be killed, even if they are public enemy number one. The rule is that unless you get into um, a hot conflict, you capture the person and put them on trial for their criminal offences. Mm. And now, if, if that's the paradigm we're talking about, then to kill bin Laden, tempting though it may be, would be murder, nothing short. And that's usually not something that we well, approve I, of. This is, I think, where we, we might disagree in practical terms. Let's imagine the difference between Osama bin Laden on a street in Sydney and Osama bin Laden on a battlefield in Afghanistan. You okay? That's the difference between hot war, laws of armed conflict, Geneva Convention, and criminal procedure. Um, okay, you've got him in your sights in Sydney, and you can take him out without killing anyone else, and you know you've got Al-Zakawi to negotiate with. What are you going to do? Well, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not a war zone, so that would so be illegal. You wouldn't kill him? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So the, 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 the yeah. desirable but, but end see, isn't see, justified terrorism, by the illegal means. Terrorism is a form of illegal warfare, and that, that's the problem. You know, it's, mm. it's both illegal and a form of warfare. And so there's sort of an, it's not a grey area, it's actually an overlap where you could choose to apply the laws of armed conflict mm. or you could choose to apply the laws of criminal procedure. Yeah, um, if, if you regard it as warfare in a real sense. Well, I think if an organisation declares war on you and takes up arms and starts killing your civilians, then there may be some de jure doubt about it, but in practical terms, you know, you're at war. Now, um, if, if I can just come back to the title of, the, of our talk to tease out some ideas before we develop it. Um, the question of whether the end justifies the, me uh, the means justify the end rather, sorry, the end justifies the means, raises the question, well, what are the means we're talking about? And you may have to distinguish between means which are incompatible with our most centrally held beliefs, you know, cardinal sins, if you want to use the religious mm -hmm. classification, as opposed to lesser sins, so the venial sins. So, you know, a little bit of lying here and there. You're not Catholic by any chance. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> But it's, just a, it's, a, it's a distinction which I know about and which is useful for the purpose. Um, and, and then you have to identify, well, what's the end? Um, the end may be the intended objective or it may be the actual consequences of what you do, including unintended consequences. Mm. And that seems to me to be quite an important um, consideration when debating whether or not any uh, desired end will justify the means. Um, but it depends on whether the means are really awful or just a little bit bad or mm, right. somewhere in between. And I, I gather that you agree with me that the end won't ever justify the means. What I think is in philosophical terms, pretty clearly, the end you know, doesn't justify the means. Mm -hmm. In practical terms, it depends. You know? It depends what the end's end is and it depends what the means are. Um, well, that can't be an ethical argument, can it? No, I think I'm saying in practical terms, yeah. it, it depends. Yeah. Um, and, and you make judgments based on ethical reasoning 
That's what apropos of asking if you're a Catholic. You make ju judgments in the field based on a process of ethical reasoning, not on a sort of black and white rule set. Um, okay, because well, that, let, that doesn't really work that, that well. If ethical reasoning takes you to a conclusion that you can't do what you want to get the end that you desire, and practical considerations say it would be good to do it, which way do you jump? Do you go with well, no, I think ethics that, or with practicality? I think you go with ethics. I mean, I think, and, but there's a longer term practical argument for being ethical. You know? mm -hmm. um, what, one of the classic texts of counterinsurgency is Robert Thompson's book, um, Defeating Communist Insurgency. And there's a whole chapter there about the rule of law. And in, in my course at university, we teach a, a whole, whole module on ethics, morality, and the rule of law and counterinsurgency. One of the points that Thompson makes is the critical strategic advantage that a government has in a counterinsurgency environment is it's the government. It has legitimacy. It has the rule of law. And you step away from that at your peril because as soon as you go outside the rule of law and outside proper ethical practice, you reduce yourself to being just one armed faction amongst many. And you lose that extremely important strategic advantage of being the government. And he says, look, there's times when the law will not allow you to do all the things you need to do. In those circumstances, there's a procedure for changing the law. You go to parliament and you work through the, and we change laws all the time, um, and you can do that. But you don't step outside the law and start taking illegal action, or you just undermine your long-term advantage. So I think if you take a long-term enough, a, a long enough view, that the practicality and the ethics arguments come back together. Um, and it's actually much more sensible in long-term strategic terms to stick to uh, what's ethical and proper in legal terms. Mm. We saw that played out in practice um, in um, the functioning of Guantanamo Bay and the revelations at Abu Ghraib, where it seemed that the objective being sought, at least ostensibly, was to take out of the field um, the, you know, the people, the killers, the terrorists, the, the worst of the worst. Um, but America did so um, by a process that undermined or ignored its own most fundamental beliefs about the treatment of prisoners uh, and about the criminal process. Now, the end, if you take it at face value, was probably a desirable one. The means were unquestionably unlawful and, I think, to most people, abhorrent. Um, and that seems to have had including, the, the exact, including to Americans, yeah. include, exactly so, including Especially to Americans, yeah. within the country and outside the country. It mm. seems to have damaged America's image greatly. Well, there are two quotes in my book which, which I think are relevant here. One, one is a quote from a Chinese book that was published in 1998 called Unrestricted Warfare, which was published by two Chinese senior colonels. And one of the points that they make in this book is America is the most powerful country in the world in military terms. But even so, these guys say the Americans have to follow their own rules or the whole world won't trust them. Uh, and I think that's the danger of walking away from your own rule set. Um, and the, the other point that I make in, in the book is that America is so dominant in military terms that unless people believe that America's intent is fundamentally um, good and honourable and virtuous, then they have, to, by definition, have to treat America as a threat. It's powerful enough to destroy the rest of the world. The only reason the rest of the world doesn't fight America is they know America's not going to do that. But as soon as you cast doubt on that, that understanding of what the intent might be, then all sorts of people start jockeying against you. And in international relations theory, we call that a security dilemma, where you may ta take actions that seem sensible to you to preserve your own security, but they look threatening to somebody else. So they take actions to preserve their security, which look threatening to you, and you get into this cycle. Uh, and avoiding that is one of the reasons why we have these legal and ethical constraints on behaviour. Uh, and I, yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, it's fundamentally important. It's actually an interesting reflection of Hobbes's Leviathan in which he made the point that no one is so weak that they can't hurt another and no one is so strong that he can't be hurt. Right. Which is why we need to set a baseline of, of agreement and cooperation about what conduct is going to be accepted and what isn't. Right. And once you depart from that agreed baseline, well then of course all bets are off and right. everyone is vulnerable. And of course that is the thinking un that underlies terrorism. Terrorists are deliberately trying to break down that paradigm of um, acceptable behaviour so that their target will react by doing something that's counter to its own interest. They're trying to provoke an overreaction that undermines uh, the target. And it, we, at times in the war on terrorism, all the countries that have been involved in counter-terrorist action have come close to that line or even gone over it in terms of doing things that have ultimately harmed them. Mm. And I think a longer term view of 
how to deal with a threat like Al-Qaeda tells you that um, you really do need to stick to rule of law, um, ethical behavior, and yes, it will make it harder to fight Al-Qaeda. Um, but the other way of trying to kill your way to victory, you know, we've tried that, it doesn't work. Mm. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, what, what you've just spoken about raises uh, plainly enough the, the, the syndrome of the accidental gorilla, and right. I have had the privilege yeah. of reading your book, but many people in the audience haven't. So tell us, explain to us what the accidental gorilla syndrome okay. is. So the, the argument of the book is that about 95% of the people that we ended up fighting in Iraq and in Afghanistan at different times were what I call accidental guerrillas, who are people who were fighting us not because they supported al-Qaeda, not because they had anything to do with 9-11 or supported the Taliban or anything like that, but primarily because we went into their valley or in their village looking for the enemy and created a backlash against us. And I use the analogy in the book, imagine that you live in a depressed suburb somewhere and a gang moves into your district and they start intimidating you and they create a safe haven for themselves. And then they go and start blowing up the rich people on the other side of town. That's pretty much what Al-Qaeda did in Afghanistan. They weren't targeting the Afghans. If the police then come into your district and start blowing up people's houses looking for the, for the gang, then sooner or later the whole district is going to turn against the police and you'll end up with an insurgency. That's exactly what happened in some parts of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, just to clarify, we didn't start it. The enemy started it. But our reaction to the enemy provoked this accidental guerrilla syndrome. And in the surge in Iraq and in what we've been trying to do in Afghanistan for the last few months, we're trying to break that cycle. And instead of taking a punitive approach to the local population, to sit down and take basically a bottom-up peace-building approach where we show them some respect, we engage with them, and we negotiate together a way to marginalize that gang that's been oppressing them. Um, and of course, that allowed us in Iraq to bring the level of violence down from 3,000 dead civilians a week to you know, a bad night in, Iraq, in Afghanistan being one or two people by the end of the surge. Mm. Um, you know, 99% reduction uh, in violence. And, and the 3,000 a week, just to put it in context, is equivalent to the number who died on September 11. So every week there's a yep. September week, 11 happening September 11, in week after week after week. Yeah. In fact, more than that, because the US population is 300 million, hmm. the Iraqi population is around 30 million, so 10 9-11s a week. Hmm. And you can imagine the terrible destruction that happened to Iraqi society as a result of that violence coming on top of 25 years of fascist oppression by uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, and so our fundamental problem in the start of the surge was to actually get back with the Iraqis and sit with them and say, you know, sorry about what's just happened to you. Let's figure out a way to defend your district together, to make your children safe, and to push the, uh, the takfiri, the, the, um, mm. the extremists, out of your district. And, you know, people responded to that. And um, we had a rapid turnaround in the war, mainly because we finally got off our ass and showed some respect to the yeah. Iraqis. Now, of course, um, coming back to the subject, the, the objective, the end that was sought in the invasion of Iraq was um, the removal of the di dictator and breaking the axis of evil, breaking the link to terrorism. And the means used was a war, which I think most international lawyers would say was an unlawful war. Um, and depending on the view you take, some political dishonesty or um, yeah. fudging at least. So the means were highly questionable. The objective looked sensible. Um, the end that was actually achieved, of course, was the uh, fall of Blair and Bush um, and the creation of civil war in, in Iraq, as well as the removal of Saddam Hussein. Um, now, the, the, the fact that civil war was created um, caused a problem which I think, um, you know, no one, at least no one in the public expected, but you would have predicted it. In fact, I think you did predict it. Yeah, well, in fact, you know, the insurgency in Iraq was not only predictable, it was predicted. I mean, the whole counterinsurgency community spent several months, and, and the State Department, by the way, spent several months before the war saying this is a really, really bad idea, you know, uh, and there's going to be an insurgency, we won't have the troops on the ground to handle it, it will destabilize the Sunni-Shia balance and the uh, Arab-Persian balance in the Middle East, it'll have far-reaching consequences, and we haven't finished the war in Afghanistan. You know, let's just, let's just focus on that. Um, 
And that's kind of received wisdom now, but it was pretty unpopular as a point of view back in 2002. And clearly and a lot it didn't of, work. Well, and a lot of people said, um, you know, um, you guys only think that because you're counterinsurgency specialists, <laughs> which is like saying, yeah. you know, you only think two and two equals four because you're a mathematician. Um, <laughs> but um, having said that, we argued the case as hard as we could to not go to war. When the government decided to go to war, some of us resigned and others decided to stay and try and make it better. Now, I was one of a bunch of people who spent four or five years basically whinging about the conduct of the war and saying again and again till we were very unpopular, there's a better way to do this, you're doing it wrong, we can change it. Um, and finally, at the end of 2006, President Bush decided to give us our head um, and appointed Dave Petraeus to run the war in Iraq. Um, about 11 minutes after he got appointed, he emailed me and said, will you come to Iraq as my, uh, my chief strategist? And at that point, I, I was in a position of, you know, I'd been whining for years that we should be doing it differently, and I was offered the chance to go and end the war, uh, and I felt like, you know, that the only honourable choice was to, was to do that. Now, so we went, and this led to, clarify, to the surge. That led to, well, it, the surge was President Bush's initiative. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but the surge was um, part of the effort that you're involved in, and it, it involved a dramatic change in tactics or in yeah, tactics and strategy. Right.